Hello, Jordan. People like the uh, the post I put up this morning on our Instagram feed. Oh, wow. You're j- you're jaying it on me. What did you put up? And by the way, good job posting. Yeah, you only had asked me twice in the, in the last 24 hours. That was good. That was good. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, I put up, <laughs> it was actually funny. It was a funny one. It was a clip of when you were reading someone's question and they were asking about a plank with a tricep extension. And I was like, what the fuck is a plank with a tricep extension? <laughs> and there, and uh, David made a whole clip about that. So I posted that this morning. It was a funny one. That's awesome. People enjoyed it on our Instagram at personal trainer podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Instagram, YouTube. Yes, sir. They enjoyed it. They liked our, our facial expressions while ex- like trying to decipher what the fuck that would look like. I'm going to have to jump on Instagram on my desktop, which for the last 10 days is where I have been using Instagram only to check the PT pod page, if I'm being completely honest. Uh, and I'll have to watch that one. Yo, bring your mic closer to your mouth. You can't hear, turn the volume up on your computer. I just turned it up literally to the max. I can hear you. It's just, it's not as, uh, not as like, oomph as it normally is. Oh, interesting. Okay. How's this? There we go. Yes, that's better. All right. Uh, Dude, I'm I'm exhausted. Yeah, get get that phone on DND. Let me turn on DND. <laughs> what? What I uh, what happened? Why are you exhausted? Well, I just hit a, a big time pull day. However, I'm usually real jacked up. And I made a pre-workout switch that I was telling you about in the last week. And so previously I was having a third of a can of ghost and a quarter scoop of David Lade's Euphoria, mm-hmm. which had like unbelievable psychostimulatory benefits. There's only like mm-hmm. 150 milligrams of caffeine total in, in the combination of the two. But um, my my mental state during my workout and for hours after my workout was incredible. And so I'd have that. Then we'd podcast or do a, a Q&A with the mentorship. Like that's peak mental state for me. If we don't have anything else, then I'd be designing training programs or doing client updates, whatever it might be. But that was like a highly productive time frame. I switched over out of nostalgia because I found this this giant thing of Purple Wrath, which was highly recommended by Martin Burkhen back in the day. It's basically BCAAs. There's a little bit, there's like some beta alanine, there's some kind of proprietary blend in there. But uh, I found a giant jug of it that's about to go bad in my cabinet that I probably bought two years ago. I was like, why not? So I did a scoop of that with a little less than a full scoop of Legion. So it's still 150 milligrams of caffeine, but obviously some of the ingredients are different from my prior pre-workout. My actual lifts, the last few lifts have been incredible, like very strong, very explosive, felt really good. However, there's no like there's no mental upside. There's no mm. euphoria for lack of a better term. So I'm starting to think there's something illegal in one, in either ghost or euphoria. <laughs> there's something weird. Some kind of in, meth in there that really. Some kind of, just... <laughs> some kind of meth or like a nootropic or like something that is super stimulatory mentally, but not as beneficial physically. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work through that. I might have to go to the old stack prior to f- filming. Are you taking pre-workout before every workout? Jordan, I haven't lifted without caffeine since. <laughs> but just caffeine isn't a pre-workout. Yeah, it is. I mean, I guess it, it depends how much, but. I haven't lifted without caffeine legitimately since the year 2007, probably. Oh, wow. Since you were in college. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Good job. See? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, I thought it was interesting. There's also, I, I, I understand that BCAAs are completely irrelevant and the science says they don't do anything and yada, yada, yada. I, I know what, what the evidence says about BCAAs. There is something about my like energy levels and like physical energy levels for four to six hours after I take Purple Wrath that uh that i can't explain and i don't know what it is but it's a it's a very unique like 
calm, zen, interesting feeling that probably comes from the proprietary blend and not the actual amino acids, but there's something there. I think you're a hyper responder and like super sensitive to branch chain amino acids. I feel like once you've got those <laughs> flowing through your blood, you're just like, you're in a zone. You haven't had a meal without protein since 1994. You no, respond no, no. Not so 90, well to protein. Oh, 97, 97. got it, 97. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So since you're like nine years old, or like, no. Yeah, uh, 10, nine, yeah. 10. Yeah, so I just feel like the way, like you love protein and how it makes you feel, and you love amino acids, and so- but- <laughs> I love this little tangent run. The thing is, <laughs> other brands of amino acids, other brands of BCAAs do nothing. It's only Purple Wrath. Now that's interesting. Which, and you know, wild, wild west, unregulated supplement space, like who knows what's in these things? That's probably <laughs> got me all hyped up. I want to know what's in this pr- proprietary blend. We got to contact like, Purple Wrath. Well, I, well, <laughs> yeah, uh, controlled Labs is who makes it. And by the way, zero affiliation, uh, as always, but um, I, I want, I think it's a very small amount of beta alanine, maybe a small amount of citrulline malate. The entire proprietary blend is supposedly 2,700 milligrams, so 2.7 grams. So even if you picked one of the supposed ingredients in the proprietary blend, it wouldn't be at the clinically effective dosage for a pre-workout. Mm-hmm. Like, like a Legion's Legion has eight grams of citrulline malate in a, in a full serving. Jeez. Any decent pre-workout has at least six grams of it. Um, yeah. So I don't know what they're putting in the purple wrath, but it's Adderall. sensational. Just no, no, it's not. No. It's not because there's no, you're mixing up the pre-workouts here. Oh, 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 oh got it, got it, got it. They there's, don't have there's the no psycho stimulus. No, Interesting. but strength benefits Interesting. and muscle endurance benefits. Anyway, anger. Oh, anger. That post. You loved that post that I sent to you. Well, I, I just am so comp- – as, as a bro myself, I recognize that the bros are always one to two decades ahead of the scientists and yeah. always have been. And yeah. you and I have been harping on this point for years, which is mm-hmm. anger is an incredible – uh, tool for motivation. Yeah. New research study came out. I saw it pop up. Basically, anyone who's want been listening to, to the podcast to for a while. Yeah, 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 yeah. A- anyone who's listening to the podcast for a while and has heard us talk about this will will laugh just because we've gone hard on like how anger can be so helpful. And uh, I-, I saw a new research study come out discussing how anger is super helpful for it. And I forwarded it to Mike. Get you re- read the post. Getting angry boosts performance and productivity, study finds. A new study by the American Psychological Association surveyed more than a 1,000 people who were triggered into experiencing a specific emotion and then given a task. The study found anger elicited shorter response times and higher scores on the task. Yeah, yeah. And that just... That's, I can relate to that so hard. When I get angry and I want to do something... Oh man, it's just unstoppable. It be, it's like, I do it super fast. It's high quality. I'm like, my pupils are dilated. I'm ready to like, it's just, I'm, I'm ready to go versus any other emotion. Contentment is not good for productivity. That's, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely right. <laughs> it's great for life and happiness. It's not good for work. Relating this to coaches watch watch me tie this in oh wow. in our in our content creation module in the mentorship i remember you talking about you know writer's block or if you're not uh if you're struggling with coming up with ideas for content what's one of your best pieces of advice think of something that makes you angry and write about it it's the best way to get out of writer's block mm-hmm. if you don't i don't know what what to do well what pisses you off in the industry write about it talk about it make a content make content about it it's just immediately, no more writer's block. Bingo, bango, bongo, bro. 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 Orange juice is criminally underrated. Wow. From a pre-workout perspective? From a, uh, we all know what healthy protein looks like. We all know what healthy fats look like. 
carbs are more interesting for me, at least personally, especially at breakfast time, because I don't want a lot of volume in my stomach when I'm training. Um, but I want to get carbs in my system because I feel better working out from a performance perspective. Uh, and, and I also don't want to have things that lead to digestive distress, which mm-hmm. could be a, a high amount of, of, uh, carbs or could just be like, you know, gluten for some people or wheat or, or whatever they don't feel amazing on. For some reason I had orange juice squarely in this like regular soda, like never drink your calories bucket of, I, I mean, I probably haven't had orange juice in 20 years and we had orange juice in our refrigerator enhanced with calcium and vitamin D, whatever. And I was looking for a carb to have with breakfast and I just poured eight ounces of OJ, 24 grams of carbs right there, little vitamin C, underrated. Was your wife drinking the orange juice? Is that why it was in the fridge? Yeah. She's got a little mix with, uh, with a, a scoop of vanilla protein powder and like oh, six ounces that's of OJ. so good. Yeah. yeah. And orange Julius, that, she calls it. Oh, that's, that's, I love that. When I was in high school, that was a, a I would do that with blueberries. Orange mm. juice makes a great like base for protein shakes, especially if you're going a little bit higher calorie. That's smart. I like that. Yeah. But, yeah, but yeah, OJ yeah. as a carb source. Oh, you don't yeah. want to have, uh, I don't know, you don't want to have a bunch of berries or you don't want to have watermelon because you're going to have so much more volume in your system mm. having those things, which, you know, we talk about as such a beneficial thing because a lot of people who are communicating with a lot of our clients are in fat loss phases. And so getting a little more filled up on fewer calories is a good thing. But in certain situations like this one, a couple of eggs, a little bit of protein powder, you know, where am I getting my carbs? OJ, consider it. Hmm. Yeah. Especially if like a weight gain scenario, someone struggling to gain weight, orange juice, super simple, easy. Or for someone who is uh, just struggling to get calories in general, which is obviously not the majority of the population. The majority of the population is not struggling to get calories in, but for there are those who do. There are those who do. And it's actually like OJ and, and uh, I would always do like the PB&J recommendation for the, the hard gainers, as we used to mm-hmm. call them back in the day, for the, the dudes who are like, oh, I just can't eat. I'm like, all right, you're going to have a peanut butter and jelly at least two a day. And that just adds up like a thousand calories so fast. Yeah. Yep. That's great advice. That's liquid calories are good for that population in general. But, but, and that's good advice. And I think we knew that. I think there's additional benefit, even for people who aren't hard gainers or aren't trying to get additional calories in. Interesting. Maybe it's just, maybe like, it's just in the pre-workout window when you don't want, yeah. but. You mean what, like not like being super full, but still getting the carbs in? There's, there's that. And there's like, I'm starting to realize that there aren't that many carb sources that I feel good on digestively, mm. like uh, not having a crash later on, you know, having 70, five grams of carbs via oatmeal in the morning doesn't lead to a maximally productive day for me. Yeah. 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 Do you have orange juice pulp or no pulp? No pulp. No pulp. What, what brand? I don't know. Sim- simply orange. Simply Does orange. Right? Yeah. Tropicana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one of those two. Yeah. Two like the classic American OJ sources. Love that. That's right. That's right. What was that? What was that fake orange juice when we were kids? It was the chimpanzee on the front, and like in the commercials, it was Sunny D, Sunny Delight. You remember that? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> Sunny D is delicious, bro. Sunny D, man, that's like fake orange juice. But oh, you know what else? You ever have Orangina? No. Oh man, you would love Orangina. We used to call it Orangina. Orangina is super, dude, it's, oh my God, it's so good. It's not like real orange juice. It's just soda, but that stuff, you'd love it. Like a, like a Fanta or an orange soda? Um, similar. It's not as sweet. It's not as sweet as Fanta. It's, it's has like a little bit of a bitterness to it. I think from what I remember, it was, it was my favorite soda as a kid, but yeah, yeah. yeah. But Sunny D man, that stuff was, that was fantastic. And that chimpanzee commercial sorry to go off topic but just think about no, all the I like different it. i like juice. it it's i like bit... the pulp I, li- I like the pulp and orange juice there was something about it my brother was always like what the fuck like pulp is the worst he would gag if there was pulp in it i feel like it's whatever you grow up on 
That's the weird part. I liked pulp and my brother didn't like pulp. We grew up in the same house. Did you have both options? Uh, we would alternate. Sometimes we'd get with, sometimes we'd get <laughs> without was, because- This was a real thing in the side household? <laughs> yeah. Are we getting- I wanted pulp Lee, and he didn't want pulp. We got pulp. no pulp last week. Come on, Jordan. And then Pulp's he would gross. strain it. And then when we would get the pulp, he would take out the strainer. <laughs> so he wouldn't get, I get the that. pulp. <laughs> I get that. I get that. I- I can respect not wanting physical objects in my liquid drink. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see. But then the pulp feels a little more natural too, a little healthier psychologically. Yeah. Jeff Bezos is moving from the state of Washington to Miami on speculation that uh, – well, not on speculation, but one of their – Senators, I don't know, Congresswomen is proposing a bill that will tax net worth. Oh, geez. Mm -hmm. And supposedly, uh, his net worth would make up almost 50% of the total annual revenue that the, the plan would bring in in tax dollars per year. That's disgusting. I don't know if it'll pass, but- that's a wild, like taxing assets on an annual basis is a wild concept. Yeah. If you think of all, if you think of all the forms of taxation, income tax has been normalized, uh, sales tax, um, but to tax what you own, and it wouldn't be everyone, obviously, I, I haven't read the proposal. I'm assuming it's just very high net worth individuals, but it's still interesting to think like, you already paid taxes on this money. Yeah. It's yours. And then some amount every year is going to go back to the state government. It's crazy. Well, do you know what, what the percentage of tax, like when, when the people in the UK decided they wanted to leave and come to the United States because of the taxes, do you know what percentage they were getting? Like, what were they what was that percentage? I don't know what the percentage was, but it wasn't it wasn't the fact that they were being taxed that they were upset about. It was the fact that they were being taxed by a government that they didn't have any say in right who the government was. So it was the right. fact that it wasn't a representative democracy. Right. No taxation were, without representation. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it was like three percent or something. And they were like fuck this, like, <laughs> I'm not doing 3% taxes, <laughs> right? Like, Colonial and early Americans paid a very low tax rate, both by modern and contemporary standards. Just prior to the revolution, British tax rates stood at between 5 to 7%. Americans' tax rates were 1 to 1 1.5%. Yeah, single digit taxes is what led to people being like, we're going to have a war. We're out. We're gone. We're going to go across the ocean and fuck off. And now we're getting taxed at like 30, 40, 50% and people are like more, 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 more. What what is going on, dude? What like at what point did people say taxes are good, especially exorbitantly high taxes? There's a point for them. I get it. But I mean, dear I, I just don't understand. I don't understand how people are just willing. You, you know, I think a lot of it is people, it's just automatically taken out of their checks. And so they just never think of it as their money to begin with. And so it's like, you know, out of sight, out of mind. I don't think about it. This is why I think everybody needs to spend every ever for three years. Everyone must be required to pay taxes out of their own account in terms of like, they have to write a check to the IRS for three years of their life, they have to do that. And then I think we would see a change in opinion of, of what's going on. Interesting. There's a, there's a lot of political theory behind this and a lot that I don't understand at all. So, mm -hmm. oh, I got a good one. This actually, I think you would massively benefit from this. And I benefited from it over the last few days. There's a, there's a psychiatrist, Dr. Daniel Amen 
He's like in his seventies, super sharp. He's been making content for the last several years. Um, has has a practice. He's worked with over two hundred fifty thousand patients over the years. Like his practice, analyzed brains, like in person consults. You know, treating all depression, anxiety, being like the big ones. He uh, he his number one piece of advice for someone who is that he said specifically related to depression, I would imagine it applies to everything on that spectrum as well as a host of other things that we may or may not call mental illnesses. But the number one thing that people should stop doing to feel less depressed is stop watching the news. Now, I I think, I think that we have internalized that we understand that I would say, Going back to like 2010 to 2013 time frame, like that's been known and 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 executed on. I would say at least for me, solidly. However, the news isn't just turning on the TV and watching CNN or Fox or MSNBC anymore. There's news all over this thing constantly, no matter what uh, platform you're on. And I've realized over the last few weeks that. You know, especially with all the stuff in in Israel, my Twitter is it, it just like the most depressing and like news ridden thing ever. So even if it's not coming mm-hmm. from a mainstream organization, it's still constantly plugged in to tragedy and atrocity around the world. And I'm not making this specific about ten seven or yeah, Israel, yeah. but just news in general. But now news has infiltrated this thing that most of us are addicted to and like consuming out of constantly. It was a nice reminder of, you know, exercise, like move, get sunlight, social interaction. These things are all good for our mental health. But this dude who's worked with tons of people had at the top of his list, stop watching the news. And and then with the caveat, yes, you should be educated and you can be educated through, uh, you know, ways where you're not committing hours and hours every single day to just consuming information. Dude, I I love that. I agree with it wholeheartedly. There's a lot that I would say about that. Number one being like social media, like the the short form content has this really unique way of making you feel like you're becoming educated when you're not. Mm. It's it's a very unique way of of giving you a lot of information with uh, one of my favorite quotes is social media is where nuance goes to die. And you're getting a lot of very face value information that you think is educating you and it's actually not. Um, I think if someone wants to get educated, whether it's on whatever conflict, whether it's the Israeli-Palestinian, whether it's Russia-Ukraine, whatever it is, like the place you should be going to is like history books. You, You don't go to... If you're only looking at current events, it, it would sort of be like, imagine you have a client who's like, oh yeah, I'm really struggling. Um, I, I've struggled my whole life with my weight, da, 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 whatever. And all you wanted to know is like, well, what'd you have for lunch today? That's all the information you have. What'd you eat for lunch today? Like, and that's it. And you only see them eat that lunch every day. You only, or it, same thing. Like if, it, oh, that person, they can eat whatever they want. Like every day I see them, like we wrote about in our book, that person at the office, they, they always have a chocolate bar. They're like every single day, they can eat whatever they want. It's like, well, yeah, you see them eating a chocolate bar, what they have for breakfast, what they have for lunch, what it like, what, what about their workouts? What have they been doing their whole life? How much muscle have they built? Like there's so many aspects of this that you're not seeing. It's when you're looking at these individual posts on social media and you think you're becoming informed on the topic, you're actually just seeing one glimpse that like you cannot confirm what's actually going on. You're seeing one snapshot in time that is, by the way, specifically designed to make you want to watch it for longer. I'm watching a ton of platforms, a ton of people, especially now with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, people who are blowing their platforms up with now millions and millions of followers. And they're noticing that like, oh my God, my account's growing, getting so many more people following me. If you think that these people who are oftentimes calling themselves journalists and reporters are not overwhelmingly happy that their accounts are growing dramatically and getting more attention and now getting more sponsorships and seeing their business grows, literally using a conflict and people dying as a means of, of uh, building their own business. You're out of your mind. Like this is, 
their ability, like the more they post, the more likes they get, the more shares, the more followers, they're building their business on the backs of people dying. And they're, they're often using this as a way to grow their audience. So it's there. And this is what the news does. The news does it as well. Like, okay, what can we do to get people to watch, to get more advertiser dollars? It's the exact same thing, just on a different platform. Yep. 100%. Yeah. Fuck the news. <laughs> Anywhere, do you want to take that anywhere else or is just that? No, I just, I just thought it was a good reminder uh, of something that we both know. But like, I would say um, I love the point about reading books rather than watching news uh, mm-hmm. for so many reasons. One being like uh, the barrier to entry for a book is so large, right? Mm-hmm. Like someone took so much time to write that thing, to get it edited, to get it published and, you mm-hmm. know, going back – uh, self-publishing has only been along, around so long. So going back prior to that, like it was hard to get a book published versus like, okay, we need a story for this for today to just spit it out. It's less reliable. It's uh, less informative. There's less detail. Um, no, just the, it's, it's clearly consuming. It's clearly bad for us. And it used to just be sitting down in front of the TV consuming it, which some people still do. And that's also really bad for you. But now it follows us all around everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Something to be aware of. Yeah. Be because aware it, of it. It, it. It can get you like that. And it's not oh, yeah. like the whole feed is that, right? You got, uh, I don't know. Elon's so good with the algorithm at making me watch crap that I – like stimulates me and I want to be watching, but Mm -hmm. I actually don't want to be watching fight videos, random, like, yeah, just tap my brain. Speaking of Elon, and this is a little bit of a a shift, like not a full 180, but like it is a little shift. Uh, Basically this reporter was interviewing Elon and this, this reporter is like, I feel like you post things that are very like uh, encouraging of conspiracy theorists. And, uh, and Elon's like, what do you mean? Give me an example. And, uh, and the guy gave a, an example, which was not even a conspiracy theory. And Elon was like, no, 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 I, I, I believe that. Like, I, I believe that's true. Oh, he was talking about George Soros. I don't know, whatever Elon said about George Soros. And the guy was like, but why say it? Well, why give your opinion? And Elon was like, because I want to. Because I want to give my opinion. Like, I have a whole platform that allows people to give their opinions, whether they, I agree with them or not. And he was like, but don't you have like sponsors or, or people who are uh, getting upset with you and maybe they want to pull out and not give you money as, because you're giving your opinions? And Elon pauses for 12 seconds. He, he just doesn't say a word. He's like looking at the guy, sort of looks into space for 12 seconds, which is a long time in a conversation, especially on like a TV interview. And Elon just goes, this reminds me of a quote from The Princess Bride. Where a guy says, offer me money, offer me power, I don't care. And it was just like a super, he was like, if me giving my opinion leads to a loss of money, like, so be it. I'm going to say what I very much believe to be the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, man, I don't always agree with everything Elon says or does, but like that was... I, I, I do really like him a lot by and large. And that was, that was a sick quote. I love that. I've seen that clip. That is awesome. And it's, yeah. it's rare in, uh, in the current culture, the things that we value on average as a society, like most people in his, most billionaires value money more than they do something else telling the saying what you believe even if that's gonna negatively affect your bank account yeah did you see him on on rogan again recently i i saw that he was on there i didn't i watched maybe one minute of it i (laughs) it just doesn't even the first episode or two remember when he smoked weed and there was the big meme about it yeah 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 and he's clearly brilliant but i don't know why i and i listened to a lot of podcasts I haven't found him on there to be uh, particularly insightful or yeah, yeah, entertaining or like interesting for the things that I'm interested in. I don't know. 
I feel like he's so smart that it's really like I can't watch him and and like really enjoy it. I'm, I'm it's almost like you've got a book that you know there's some great information in, but the way it's written is just really bad. And like, you don't like, you know what I mean? Like sort of like the way he talks, I have a really hard time relating to. And I'm like, I just, I can't listen to it. Like, I like his short form thoughts much better than his long form discussions. Cause when he's just talking, I'm like, I can't, it's like a book that I like. I, it's, it's getting through one paragraph is fucking difficult. Yeah. There was, there was a, a very popular clip from that podcast going viral in the jujitsu community though. Cause Elon was explaining how he would his strategy to fight someone and how like yeah if i get if i get on top of them they're done and you know joe's a black belt in jujitsu and joe's just looking at him like what do you mean <laughs> and, and elon's like well you know like i would just smother them like you know like if a horse falls on top of you you can't get out and joe's like yeah but you're not a horse <laughs> like, mm -hmm. just like the the and the mma community was like yeah this just Elon doesn't know what he's talking about with fighting. That was, that was a, a funny clip from that. But overall, I, I like a lot of his thoughts. It's just very difficult to hear him talk. Yeah. That that reminds me of something interesting. Uh, I remember back in the day, I feel like this was maybe Tim Ferriss related or like the early days of people making content and listening to podcasts where I really looked up to and like, you know, relied on and not Tim specifically, but like people in that era relied on them for information about a wide variety of topics. But then they'd say something very confidently about fitness. Yeah. That was not accurate whatsoever. <laughs> and then I'm like, wait a second. Why am I believing everything he's saying about all these things that I don't know anything about? But then the one thing I do know that I'm certain yeah. on here. He's like wildly off. Yeah. It's just interesting. Yeah. It's very true. It's, it really makes you question like, oh shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so does this mean all that other stuff was wrong? Yeah. He said it so confidently. I just believed it. Mm -hmm. There was a great TED talk that went viral. This like college student who the, his entire TED talk, he was like, I'm sure if you Google TED talk about nothing. Basically, he was like, this whole TED Talk is about nothing. I will change my tone and my intonation and my hand gestures all throughout this TED Talk. And by the end of it, you will have learned nothing. And it was for the entire time, like 18 minutes. It was and it was amazing. And obviously... The funny part about it is like you did learn, you learned the importance of, of how you speak and how you articulate yourself and, and how you present yourself and changing your tone and all of that. But literally that was the entire thing. He's like, I'm going to take my glasses off and I'll look smart when I do it. And then I'll put them back on and you'll say, <laughs> wow, <laughs> it's almost like, like <laughs> I'm thinking of like Trump, you know, they say I'm great. And you'll say, oh my God, oh my God, he was right. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's a lot of what he does yeah. where it's like and they said oh <laughs> Bro, i'm gonna stop there <laughs> I've, been, I've been getting a, i've been getting a lot of shane gillis trump impersonations oh he's not a lot maybe so three. good but he's then so good one of them where he describes how he does it yeah you, do you know what i'm talking about yeah where he's yeah, like yeah you don't you don't actually need to mirror his voice. You just he did the hand gesture and then he's like yeah. and then you just reference something that you said earlier. It's it's a funny clip. Yeah, you yeah, you say like you say what you want to say and then you say that you said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Michael, he's a great personal trainer. I, I said he's a great personal trainer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every no one believed me. They all said I was wrong. And I said they said they were wrong. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's. It, <laughs> I've been thinking about bringing some impressions like that into my fitness content. I just, I haven't. I've been thinking about ordering like a, a Trump wig, from Amazon or like a Biden mask from Amazon, just so people would be very upset about it. And I need to, whatever.
Maybe I'll do that. You going to lean into that in 2024? I think I am. Trump's hands, it's a very interesting position that he puts them in. You know, like he like really externally rotates his wrists pretty hard. You know, this mm-hmm. this one. Mm-hmm. And he's like, if you're watching on YouTube, you see what I'm doing. He like really like palms out, rotates into the side. Sort of a difficult one to hold. He's got some good wrist mobility. Do you think I'm going to do you think I'm going to win our bet about me posting on social media? Yeah. I I mean, I hope that it happens. I hope that I get <laughs> to that point in my my life and career. But I think that if if I do get to that point in my life and career that you'll lose. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I think if if I in the bet being that what was it? 10 million in the bank? Is that it? T- 10 million net worth not including house. Okay, yeah. So if I get 10 million net worth, the bet is that I'll never post on social media again. Mm-hmm. Mike said, and if, and what's this type of bet called where you risk roll. nothing and I, a free roll. So if I lose, if I end up posting, I give Mike $100,000. And if I don't post, then I, I win nothing other than the <laughs> benefits of not being on social media. So, and, and Mike <laughs> thinks I'm going to lose this, lose this bet. But if that happens, I'm I not, think I win. Not- I, I, the only reason that popped into my mind is I see the excitement on your face about like, and then I'm going to put on a Trump wig. I'm going to do my hands like this and I'm going to talk like this. Like it's, it's not a bad thing at all. It's just a prediction that, that whereas the majority of my posting was driven by desire to grow business or maybe like some degree of ego in the past for you, I see a lot of like entertainer and like, you like that, like. Back yeah, and yeah, forth yeah. with it's the just audience. Fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I maybe I would just do it and pr- I, I would try something else. Maybe I would try stand up comedy. I think you'll do like, that too. Get, I think it's an and yeah. game, as Gary would say. Why not? Both? Well, not if I don't. I mean, I guess if I if if I have ten million, then I could stand to lose it's 100, only one hundred grand. <laughs> it's only one percent of your net worth. It's perfect. <laughs> so who knows? But I would I would rather win. I'd rather win. So you know, I'm my, Mitch, my videographer is like, you're really competitive. I was like, dude. I'm super competitive. <laughs> you should have been like, Mitch, if you knew the half of it, <laughs> if you knew. <laughs> you know what scene is unbelievably impressive and underrated? In a movie? In a show. I don't. Tell me. When Jon Snow is at Castle Black and he's Lord Commander and he's in, okay. he's in like his chambers and the red okay. lady is there with him. Oh yeah. Oh, and she's got yeah, like that coat on. And she yeah. tries to seduce him. Yeah. And it, and it's like about to happen and he's just like nope, not happening. Yeah. He's that a is beast. a very underrated scene. He's a beast. That yeah. You know what's funny? So I watched that the first time and I was watching it through the second time and in my mind as I'm watching it the second time, I know it's happening now. I know I know it's going to happen. But in my memory, the scene lasted much longer than it actually did. Like, in when I thought back on the scene, he had let it go much further in my mind. Mm. But then when I watch it back, he mm-hmm. actually ended it pretty decidedly and pretty swiftly. Yeah. Um, much more quickly than in my memory of it, which is interesting. Uh, but yeah, that, that was a... a and that's one of the great parts about watching it over again because there's so much that you see in the second time through. But yeah, that that is a phenomenal scene. And Jon Snow is just like the ultimate do the right thing all the time. He's uh, well, wh- you know what? I would argue that he's an ultimate do what he believes to be the right thing all the time. Because in the in the last couple seasons on like the battlefront and military front he had a couple of like strategic blunders but they weren't mm-hmm. for lack of uh they were maybe for like lack of foresight or planning strategy related not like a moral failure yeah 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 obviously make mistakes but not like uh never sacrificing his his ethics his yeah. his uh like who he is and what principles he stands for yeah. Yeah, that's well said. Mike is Jon Snow. Mike is my Jon Snow. I'm I'm not, but thank you. It's uh You are. To me. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Tell this this might be getting cut out. 
and I might not have a big enough sample. I might not have a big enough sample size on this, but I think I do. I think I have a solid like couple dozen names I could I could rally off. It's a very specific demo of potential client, which is a very hardworking dude, family man, like not not like Gary level, but you know, very wealthy and works massive amounts of hours, like probably doesn't have to work anymore. Maybe Mm -hmm. in his 40s, maybe 50s, somewhere in there. Doesn't have to work anymore. Still works 60, 70, 80, like working all the time. But can't really get it going on the fitness front, even though it's such a small commitment relative to what he's putting in at work. Mm Mm-hmm. But just can't let off the gas at work. And and uh yeah, that's a pattern I've seen over the last five years. Of someone who's just going nuts with work at that like 40 to 50 age. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they're struggling and with their fitness. Not even struggle, but like have goals that they've been unable to accomplish, mm-hmm. but they're but they are like work takes priority over fitness in every way, every time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, but but the interesting caveat is this isn't someone who's like struggling to make it like they could live off of dividends and interest income and support their family and have a really nice lifestyle. But it's like almost the competitive game aspect of business that keeps them dedicating everything to that. I wonder if it's also like the one thing that they've been really good at. Right. Where it's like For that's sure. the one at thing that like people come to them for advice People look up to them because of what they've done. Mm. And you know who's actually spoken a little bit about this? Mike Dola. Uh, I'm a big fan of Mike Dola. He was the the owner of Stronger You. Do you remember him? He uh, came to our I seminar know, when we, I you and I spoke name. in New York. He was oh, there. Really? He came like really early on in Stronger You. He was there. Um, and he recently sold Stronger You. Okay. Uh, and he and then he retired now. He 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 took the route of like he he sold Stronger You and he retired at like I don't know, in his 30s or 40s. Good for him. Um, just like, what a beast. He's got two two little kids now. Um, That's awesome. Just living right. And he's been pretty open about some of the struggles he's had uh, in terms of, you know, he he misses, I, I think, and I, I hope I'm not putting words in his mouth, but he said to the effect of like, um, you know, I miss, I miss, you know, seeing people. I miss like interacting with people. I miss, you know, being able to uh, help people like on a more regular basis. So- I do wonder if the 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 guys who are, or or women who like stay in it uh, for a long and, and, and for the, a long period of time. Way, it's like by the way, yeah. I'm saying guys because I've only That's seen. Your, it. Well, no, yeah, I, I yeah, coach yeah. tons of women, but this specific demo that I'm talking about, I can only list yeah. male examples, and I'm not just for the sake of political correctness going to say it's both. Yeah. Well, I also, you know, it's funny because we could use this exact same, we could use this, like, let's say men who do this. And then we could also use the, the general demographic of, of women who are mothers. Right. And, um, in both of these demographics, we could take the, like what they, what they've been best at for many years, either the guy who's been like a business tycoon or the, the mother who's just put everything into being an amazing mother, raising her children, like doing everything, which is like a a full-time job and insanely difficult. And sometimes they will both struggle with fitness. I think it's because, uh, a number of different potential reasons, but it's almost like as the kids get older, And the woman like doesn't have as much to do with the kids anymore and they're being more independent. And then as the guy like as his like his bank account grows and he doesn't need to work anymore, they're still doing things going out of their way to do the thing that they were best at, like trying Mm -hmm. to find like do more mothering, trying to do more business because that's what they're best at. Mm -hmm. And so like the idea of leaving it is like maybe difficult for them for for probably actually very similar reasons. But that that is a very uh, unique and interesting situation. The thing is, though, and and by the way, that's good for Mike Dola, and that's really cool. I didn't know that story. Um, the, the the part that's different is these business tycoons don't have to stop. They just need mm-hmm. to like go from seventy to sixty five hours. They just need to like yeah, pull back yeah, yeah. a little, get your three forty five minute workouts in, and like maybe get an extra hour of sleep at night. It's, it's just pull back on the reins a little bit. And, and by the way, now that I'm thinking, because obviously there's alpha business women who are 
you know, crush it in their career, usually that personality type also has their fitness dialed. Yeah, you're right. A hundred percent they do. Like they're they're the ones who it's like, oh, I got to leave at 5.30 a.m. to get to the office. I'm a practicing lawyer. It's like, okay, then I'm waking up at 4, 4.15 and I'm getting my workout in and I haven't missed a workout since, you know, eight months ago. It's that kind of personality type. But for whatever reason, yeah, I don't know. I don't, uh, what you're saying makes sense. Like it's what they're good at, but you can continue to be good at it and just let off the gas a tiny bit. That is actually really interesting. I like, you're right. When I, just looking at these demographics, men versus women, like the male business tycoon versus the female business ty- tycoon, obviously talking in generalities, but I think the, the female version generally has her nutrition and fitness way more in check, generally speaking, like usually probably not staying out, getting drunk as often. Uh, not if they're going to have drinks, maybe they don't have as many drinks. They do get up early. They get their workout in. They prioritize their self-care a little bit more, whereas the the guys often not as much. Super interesting. I've never mm-hmm. thought about that. Mm-hmm. I literally just, that made me think of, I don't even know who said it. It might've been Carl Jung, that men strive for perfection and women strive for wholeness. Mm. So maybe so maybe there's more balance to the effort. That makes sense. Yeah, that that makes total sense. You want to do some cues? Yeah, let's do a question. It's the How to Become a Personal Trainer podcast. I'll <laughs> answer. I'll answer a question here and there. Someone said, "Because of you, I bought a Garmin watch. Best purchase ever. Thank you. Love that." Do you find? Do you find the heart rate on the Garmin to be accurate when doing outdoor cardio? When I'm doing low intensity cardio, yes. When I'm when I was doing sprints or probably anything about like zone four, zone five, no, it was not accurate. Interesting. Are are there temperature related differences in heart rate? Yeah. Okay. All right. So you think that that's accurate? Because when I would when I would compare me checking pulse to watch, uh, specifically with outdoor cardio, if it was cold outside, my Lower. heart my heart rate would be higher than what the watch said. Mm -hmm. But if it was warm outside, then they would be more synced up. Oh, interesting. Maybe, maybe, I mean, it is a piece of technology. There could be issues from that perspective of like, you know, sometimes if it gets super, super cold or super, super hot, your phone might glitch a little bit. Maybe that could be as well with the watch. I don't know. Um, But yeah, that's very interesting. I do know that from a, a heart rate perspective, It's great, especially during resting and lower intensity, but anytime you start adding more intensive movement to it with your arms swinging, uh, sweat getting involved, if if your watch isn't on super tight, it's definitely not going to be as accurate, which is why the heart rate straps, like the polar heart rate straps are generally much better. Yeah. Cool. All right. Someone asked, uh, how did you launch the inner circle? Did you just tell your clients no more one-on-one? You want to answer that or no? We definitely can. We should put the caveat that you be, almost everyone listening to this should not do a membership if you're interested in yeah. starting an online fitness business. One on one coaching is is what we strongly recommend as a starting point. I mean, how about how about we answer it? But then you just keep. How about you start with that? You start with that, and then I'll just great that. Like why why not? Uh, it's so a membership is going to be, or or one on one coaching is going to bring you something like twelve to 20 X the revenue per person. And Mm -hmm. it's much easier to get five or 10 one-on-one online fitness clients than it is to get whatever that multiple is in a membership. We've seen Mm -hmm. many, many people grow successful online one-on-one coaching businesses where, uh, you know, they might have several hundred or several thousand followers on social media, but not tens of thousands. And they're making a living from one-on-one online fitness coaching where you cannot do that with a membership. A membership, you yeah. you basically need a very large audience to scale a, a membership, $19, $24, $29 a month, and uh, and and for for revenue to match coaching versus membership. Yeah. To, to add on to that and just piggyback, people think 
that having a membership is going to be beneficial because, oh, people will sign up because it's lower cost. That is a mistake. People will not sign up for your program just because it's lower cost. If you were walking outside and someone was selling, I don't know, thumbtacks for a penny, you wouldn't buy a thumbtack just because it's a penny, just because it's very low cost, even if they're selling a hundred thumbtacks for a penny. You're not, oh yeah, I'll just like go find a penny just so I can get, unless you need a thumbtack. And this is what's really important to understand. People don't just buy stuff just because it's not very expensive. And what I've always found is that if someone is is looking for a fitness coach and they want to hire you as a fitness coach, whether it's 20 bucks or 200 bucks, if they want to work with you, then they're going to take their credit card out and they're going to work with you, regardless of whether it's 20 bucks or 200 bucks. Um, so especially early on, especially if you don't have a, a large audience, because the other aspect here is with the membership, inherently churn rate will be higher. You might get more people signing up, but you will also get more people canceling because a membership is not as individualized. It's not as one-on-one. -on -one. And so, and early on, you might want to have a membership. You might think you might get more people. What you're essentially going to do is you're going to be giving one-on-one -on -one coaching to people paying a fraction of the price. So early on, having a membership is a really bad idea. If you were like, if you, if you have a couple thousand Instagram followers, there's no reason why you couldn't get 20 30, 40, one-on-one -on -one online coaching clients. Let's just say, for example, you have 25 one-on-one -on -one online coaching clients paying you $300 a month. That's $7,500 a month. That's $7,500 a month. If you have 40 online coaching clients for $300 a month, that's $12,000 a month for 40 clients. You can absolutely do that. You don't need to do any high ticket bullshit. It's three hundred a month. It's relatively low cost. Uh, you don't like. On the other hand, let's say you have one hundred people paying you twenty dollars a month. Well, that's two thousand dollars a month. So you would need to more than double the amount of people who are willing to pay you, and you still are making a fraction a fraction of what you would be making if you had less than half of that paying you 300 for one-on-one -on -one coaching. It, it, it is a huge mistake, huge mistake to go into a membership early on without like the, really the main people, there are two different types of people who should do, do memberships. If you have a huge engaged audience of people, that's number one, or, and, or if you are very good with advertisements. And you don't need a huge audience, but you know how to reach a huge audience. Either mm -hmm. way, you need to be able to reach a huge audience, whether it's through paid advertising or organic reach, you need to be able to reach a huge audience. And even if you do know how to reach a huge audience with paid advertising, if your advertisements suck and they don't convert well, then it doesn't matter because you just be paying for advertising and people not joining anyway. So what Mike was saying is 100% accurate. Start with one-on-one -on -one coaching. And, and a lot of people think a membership is easier. It's not, it's fucking difficult. It's really hard. It takes a ton of time and energy. It's mentally and emotionally draining in the same way that, you know, one-on-one -on -one coaching can be mentally and emotionally draining. It's very difficult, but there are, there are differences. So don't do it thinking it's just easier thinking it's just, oh, it's passive income. It's easy. Like passive income doesn't exist. It's not fucking real. It is a myth designed to, in the same way that effortlessly losing weight isn't <clears throat> real. Same with passive income. Effortlessly making money isn't real. Um, so when I did decide to switch, no, I didn't just say no more one-on-one -on -one coaching. I, it was a slow transition. Uh, I created it in 2015 and I didn't, uh, I didn't stop accepting one-on-one -on -one coaching clients until 2017. And I still worked with all my one-on-one -on -one clients until about 2019 until it slowly dwindled off. And then there were some people who I let go, but the vast majority just slowly dwindled until I was working with a handful of people. And now I still work with a handful of people one-on-one, -on -one, but, um, those are just people who've been with me since like the early, 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 early days. And that's it. And there's really not even much communication. It's literally just like, Hey, here's your new program. And that's it. And mm -hmm. like, they're like, Hey, how are you? How's your baby? And that, that's it. There's not like, Hey, can you watch this technique? This just, I've been working with them for almost 10 years and it's just it's very easy. Great answer. Another question. Yeah. Let's do one more. Someone said, I finally got a walking pad. I've hit 10,000 steps every day since I got it. That's awesome. I think the walking pad is like 
one of the greatest investments I've ever made in my life. It's just, especially like now, you know, I'm in the cul-de-sac and the weather's really good here in Texas. So we walk outside all the time and I get 10,000 easy there, but in the apartment for years, you know, I, I would be with you on the phone. I would take conference calls. I would do podcasts just on the walking pad and easily get 10,000 steps a day. It's like, especially like, I, you know, especially now for, for coaches who are online coaches back in the day when people were coaching people in person, there really wasn't online getting 10,000 steps was a joke. Was, that was like a light day. But for all the online coaches now who are sitting at home, who are essentially desk workers and just answer emails all day and making content, get a fucking walking pad. Or if you want, if you have the space, get a treadmill. Sure. But walking pad, way less expensive, way more, uh, way, uh, more space efficient, very quiet. Yeah. Walking pad is where it's at. Dude, you're preaching the, if we're comparing like a day where you barely move around compared to a day where you do all the exact same things from a work perspective, but you get a whole bunch of steps in intermittently throughout the day, that's going to add up in a massive way over time. I mean, we, we already know the, the association between, uh, step count and longevity, um, yeah, it's it's a no brainer for maintaining body composition. It's so beneficial for fat loss. I I really like zone one, zone one and a half cardio. Like that calorie expenditure adds up relative to just sitting. The 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 pain relief and like wear and tear benefits of not sitting at a desk hunched over for eight to 10 hours, but instead changing positions frequently, getting blood flow throughout the body, extending your hips, activating your glutes, like getting moving is so good for you. And if you can't do that outside, the next best thing is a walking pad. So I completely agree. Um, and, and whoever wrote in, like, keep it up. That's, that's amazing. Dude, I can't believe I'm about to quote this movie. Did you ever see Legally Blonde? Um, probably Reese Witherspoon. She's a lawyer. Yeah. She's got a dog. Yeah. yeah, probably. Maybe half of it. I haven't watched this movie in years, but basically she, they're trying to figure out who killed this person and she's defending someone. And she's like this, my client did not kill this person. She exercises and she goes, exercise gives you endorphins. Endorphins make you happy. Happy people, happy people just don't shoot their husbands. They don't, they just don't. And it's like, man, you and I were talking, I think it was yesterday about how people who don't exercise, they're not all of them, but a lot, like a lot of them are just like really unhappy people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they're just, there's, there's they're just a, unhappy. And, and not like there's a spectrum of exercising, right? So th there's someone who gets a ton of steps, does lots of workouts, is very, very active all the way to completely sedentary. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. a few hundred yeah. steps a day, like very little human interaction, very little standing, just that's the way that their lifestyle is set up. And, and the people on the, on the sedentary side of that spectrum, I mean, it's definitely partly due to exercise. It's probably partly due to limited social interaction, but uh, yeah, it's, they're generally not very happy and, and it's, it's sad. You know what I'm thinking about now though, is now I'm like, okay. I think also people who take their exercise too seriously For sure. are also not happy For, people. But, you but, know, it's but like <laughs> that's why I even I even capped it. I capped the spectrum yeah. to like not include people who are psychotic. Which I yeah. like you see a disproportionate number of for various reasons, but uh, meaning like they'll be in your comments or whatever in your DMs. Oh but, yeah. But as a percentage of the population, that's nothing. Like that's <laughs> Yeah. We're, we're, I'm just lucky are, enough to we, have them in my DMs all day. Are we, <laughs> <laughs> I think, we're, are we over 70% in America of obese plus overweight? Obesity? No, well, if you take, if you stack overweight and obese BMI. Probably. Yeah. But, but, but you're right that there is, uh, the people who are exercising for hours and hours every day and have to and can't miss it. Yeah. There's, there's something unhealthy about that as well. Although I, I, I think the limit to that is much higher. And I know you would agree is much higher than you would have previously assigned it, say three to five years ago. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I it's, you know, it's funny. It's not even necessarily about the people who exercise a lot. It's more about the people who associate, 
who like their ego is wrapped up in how much they exercise, right? It's oh, like, I know some really amazing people who exercise for hours every day. Uh, and they're some of the nicest people ever, but it's the people who associate like, like everything about them. It, they're the people who are like, I do this every day. You have no reason not to. You're a lazy piece of shit. You know what? I'm going to defend these people. I don't think, <laughs> I, I don't think that they have it. And I wish I was one of them. I'm not anymore, or maybe I never was. I actually don't know, but th they, they don't have it as bad. Cause this is where I thought you were going with this. I thought you were going to say the people who feel like they have to do massive amounts of exercise to compensate mm -hmm. for nutritional failures. That mm -hmm. to me looks yep, yep. like the most, uh, yeah. Sad. Yeah. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Like, that's the most sad heart, for sure. Heartbreaking as a coach to see that and like try to unwind that. That's like a, a different aspect of it. There's like, it's like, it's like very, um, it's very sad to see. It's real. it's, it's, um, I'm literally, there's this word in Hebrew, it's called misken. It's, it's like, it's re it's really sad to see, like you feel empathetic for them. Mm -hmm. Then the other aspect of it is, um, those people that I'm talking about who are just like, fuck you, fuck you, like, like, and they're just like red in the face and they're just like, yeah, just fucking like, Durr. like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm 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 gonna go out on a limb here for our audience and I'm gonna give a real take, a real like I think I might be onto something. I think you don't like that crew because I think you're competitive with them. No, 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 no. I'm not competitive with them. I but you're so competitive. Mitch I mean, said I'm it. competitive with everybody. Yeah, you yeah know? including like them. It's all yeah, yeah, including of course. Yeah. I'm i I'm competitive with everyone, you know. I, I feel like but, you, uh, <laughs> you're you're ramping up your uh I don't want to say like anti Goggins, but like <laughs> anti Goggins. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> I feel like you're competitive with that carry the boats crew because you want to carry the boats, but right now they might just be a couple steps ahead of you and you're on their heels. Are you trying to light me up right now? They're not a couple steps ahead of me, bro. They're behind. They're my oh, okay. I'm <laughs> lapping them. I'm about to lap them. That's <laughs> I meant, I meant in terms of like weekly mileage and like not in, not in. Oh, I don't care about that. I Come to let, let, let's do a fucking. I could. Hey, let's go fight. That's fine. I don't care how much they can run. What if, <laughs> what if they're also? What if they're psychos, but they also are like brown or black? They also, so, yeah, th yeah. Then I'm in trouble. <laughs> then I'm in, I'm in deep trouble. Then I, I got to keep my opinion to myself. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> Bottom line here, movement and exercise is really, really good for mental health and, and happiness. That is the most important takeaway from this podcast. Exercise is good for you. And we hope that you understand that now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hit another question. We're just warming Welcome up, to the bro. Personal Trainer Podcast. We're ramping up. <laughs> This one might have started off a little slow. This one's ramping up late. <laughs> if you're ordering from fast food restaurants, do you always believe the calories? Yes. Yeah. There's just like a, I trust fast food far more than I trust like a, a regular restaurant where you go in and they say, hey, here's the calories for this uh, Cobb salad. And it says like 400. I'm like, yeah, fucking right. Cobb salad is like 2000. Like get out of here with that nonsense. But I think they're, the calories are much more controlled in fast food restaurants. Like they, they have to be much more strict. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it doesn't have to do with the quality of the food. Like basically the bigger, the establishment, the bigger, the name, the more trust I have in the accuracy. And I'll give two examples on one end. We'll say McDonald's golden arches, not healthy at all, but like I have a great deal of faith in the listed calories and macronutrients versus uh, a New York City bodega where there might be a, a a muffin that has like a calorie sticker on it or it says a number mm -hmm. of calories, but there's not even a real nutrition label and maybe they just wrote it on and you mm -hmm. know it's 150 calories for this giant banana nut muffin that's probably 650 calories. So yeah, fast food restaurants, you're good. And it's just not like, I see this from people who 
are maybe using the fact that they don't think they can track perfectly as a reason not to track. Whereas we know that you're, there's going to be some variance between the label and what you're actually eating. Not every portion size is absolutely perfect. And so if you're within 5, 10, 15% and you're going to have errors in both directions, so the, the, the numbers might be overstated slightly, they might be understated slightly, doing the best you can and using the, the numbers provided to you is going to get you way closer and lead to you consuming fewer calories more consistently than just not tracking. Yeah. Even, even like a, never mind the bodega, we could even look at like a McDonald's versus uh, like a Morton's or a, a, like a Nick and Sam's st- famous steakhouse or like, like a, a real restaurant. I would trust McDonald's more than I would trust one of these high end restaurants in terms of calories. I don't know if Nick and Sam's or Morton's put the calories on there, but what I'm saying is like a regular restaurant where there's the chef in the back and he's preparing it differently every time. Like, yeah, like he can, but you don't know how much oil they're using. You don't know how much butter they're using. McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, Burger King, uh, Arby's, like, like it's, this is it. And it's like, and I'm again, not talking about food quality. I'm talking about the calories. Like that shit is made like and weighed and everything is the same. That's why every time you go, the burger tastes exactly the fucking same. The fries taste exactly the, like everything is boom. This is it. Go, go, go. I weigh, I trust those calories way more than I would trust the calories in a, a higher end restaurant just because it's a different chef. You don't like even the same chef you sprinkle on the, the oil, whatever it is. Like you don't know. You don't know like exactly how many calories are in it. I agree. Going to be more variance in the higher end restaurant. I'm still, if they're publishing calories, I'm still trusting them. Yeah. 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 It's the places that don't publish it that then, then when I make my estimate, I'm going to try to overestimate, you know, cheese, butter, like just taste greasy. I'm I'm building in more fats than I think could possibly be in that entree. Also like it's good. You should just go and it's better to get an estimate, even if it's not exactly right. At least you're getting an idea, a general, like you're still tracking. Whereas you shouldn't be eating at these fucking places every day anyway. The majority <laughs> of your meals shouldn't even be at these fucking places. I'm, like I'm going to give what, one, I'm going to give one caveat for like sales, travel, sale, work travel, work travel yeah. and like salesmen. I've, I've coached a few who, yeah. Um, but yes, don't uh, if if it's within your control to any degree, don't go to high end restaurants where they don't have nutrition facts every single day. If your goal is fat loss, yeah, it's, I mean, if you're going once in a while, it's not that big of a deal anyway. But like, also, even then, for the traveling salesman that you just brought up, like, I don't know, go to the grocery store, go to I don't know, you know what I mean? Like, don't you don't have to go. You I do gotta, it all the time. I gotta, remember, it? like, no, you for always sure. go to the grocery store, pick up the <laughs> no, no, sushi no, 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 no. or, or like an apple for, and your fucking turkey sandwich. Like, come on. I got a. I'm I'm flying out to Los Angeles. I got a big meeting with uh, Pfizer. I'm I'm trying to sell them some stuff out in Los. Yeah, and, Pfizer and boy. I'm, I'm taking my. I'm taking. <laughs> I'm taking. My client to the grocery store, and we're gonna get. Yeah. <laughs> what are you taking your client to Chick Fil A? <laughs> well, no, to steakhouses. When when they're yeah yeah yeah. I'm I'm saying oh, that oh 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 these oh, it's not yeah, like yeah, oh yeah. I'm on the road so I'm just gonna go to a steakhouse because I'm on the road. It's like no, I have a, a um, I'm trying to sell right. someone something, build a relationship. Even like Gary dinners, right. like he's eating at like a little bit nicer restaurants, eating with people, networking, etc. Yeah yeah yeah, that makes sense. But when it when it's just you and when it's within your control, absolutely, I love Whole Foods. Yeah. Plenty of options there in like the ready to prepare food section. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Pack a lunch. Pack a lunch. Pack a lunch. Get a lunch box or put it in a paper bag. Paper bag lunches are the best. Pack a fucking lunch. Make a sandwich. Get some fruit in there. Get some bran buds. Make a Those salad. Are brand buds. You know what? Prepackaged salads. We haven't, we were going to talk about fiber. We haven't talked about fiber. Bran buds are awesome. Dude, I was not going to bring it up because every time I've brought fiber up, it hasn't gone well. Well, protein is better than fiber, but. Uh, 
Uh, dude, it is. I'd say equal. It, They're it, equal. No, because guess what? You love amino acids. It's not that I love them. It's it's not that I love them. I wrote a blog post called "How to Count Your Macros: A Comprehensive Guide" in October of 2013, and in that post, I had a sentence that I learned from Lyle McDonald, circa 07, which is that we can survive. So when I was deep in my in my business accounting education, I was reading about nutrition on the side. And the fact that we, and now this is like a parroted thing in the carnivore community, which I hate. But in that post, I said, you can't survive without dietary fats. You can't survive without mm-hmm. protein. You can survive without carbohydrates. So on the yeah. what is more important protein versus fiber argument, technically speaking, amino acids are more important. I can't argue with that. I really can't. Yeah, I guess I lose that one. You know what? But. No, yeah, yeah. Hit but. us with a butt. Well, I was going to try. No, and, there really was no. Butt. I was going to argue against myself. <laughs> you, Fi- you always do that. <laughs> you're like, oh yeah, yeah. Now you're going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good for digestion. It's so good. Dude, yeah, super good. Yeah, yeah. And then and then you hear the argument like, oh, well, if you were eating a healthy diet and not a standard American diet, then you wouldn't need fiber to help your digestion. No, no. Even even if you're eating primarily unprocessed, whole, like micronutrient dense foods. Having 30 to 40 grams of fiber in a day or more compared to zero grams of fiber in a day is going to lead to improved digestion and, yeah. and, and do better you, health do you, over long. Do you have any research around, uh, you know, like intestinal slash colon cancer around fiber intake? I don't have it on me, but I, I've actually, I'm bringing some, uh, uh, a cancer specialist on the podcast soon around colon cancer and how do Yeah. I mean, I don't have the research on me, but their, their rates of, of colon cancer are going astronomically high. And every specialist I've spoken to is like increased red meat, decreased fiber is the equation for increased risk of colon cancer. Like that's it. Brand buds. Brand buds have a ton of fiber, 17 grams per serving and uh, mix super well with vanilla Greek yogurt, throw some blueberries in there, maybe some blackberries. It has become my my way of curbing a sweet tooth in the evening where my calories are capped because I get really full because there's so much fiber um, and it hits the sweet tooth and prevents me from going to something else like uh, fruit snacks or Rice Krispie treats or something that I otherwise may want to snack on in the evening. I've been trying to figure out how I can beat your argument around protein being more important. That's because you're competitive. I think I've got it. Okay. I think I've got it. Okay. You win when it comes to survival. Yes. When it comes to like, there's no question. And you're a big survival guy. Dude, I'm a huge survival guy. Bushcraft (laughs) 101. A field guide (laughs) to wilderness survival. The ultimate- Survival medicine. (laughs) The ultimate survival medicine guide. Jordan's got some, if you're only on audio here, Jordan's pulling books out. Jordan has a plethora, Prepper's Long-Term Survival Guide. Jordan has all of the information (laughs) on surviving. Literally right here on the desk. Dude, I'm a big survival guy. I might have just just kicked myself in the foot for uh, for showing you all this. This is the personal trainer podcast, and that's what we do here. Yeah, we survive. But I want you to to beat me in this argument. Well, no, no. It's... it's, uh, there's, it's not beating you because when it comes to survival, protein is more important. There's no question about it. There's just no question. If you're in a survival situation, you're not looking around for fucking fiber. You're, oh God, I need fiber. You're like, no, I need to fucking eat meat, right? That's how it works. Um, assuming survival is where we're survive. We want assuming we don't just want to survive. Let's say we want to thrive. Mm. I have, an ar- wanna, I have arguments for this too. I bet you do. I <laughs> bet you do. <laughs> Once it goes into thriving and and optimizing health over the long term, mm. that's when I say protein and fiber are equal. Okay. Okay. I wouldn't say fiber's better, but I would say fiber and protein are now equal in terms of importance. But survival, yes, protein is most important. There's no arguing that. You know, in like high school debate class where there's preset topics and then you draw a topic and one person has to argue for it and one person has to argue against it. You were at, you were at quite the disadvantage in this little, uh, this little back and forth having to defend fiber against protein. So I'm going to give like, that was pretty well done by you. It's okay. Like 
it's just the truth. It's like the truth is protein is more important for survival. Like no one can logically argue against but, that. But I, I, I don't think they're equal for thriving either. Like when you th- do, es- yes, they especially are. They absolutely are. Protein is required for uh, basically maintaining and building lean tissue. You can't do it yep, without yep. consuming amino acids. Um, uh, well, there is the protein sparing effect from carbs. That's fair. Yeah, protein sparing effect from carbs would slow down the rate of muscle loss. We don't have mm-hmm. we don't have mm-hmm. a way of converting carbohydrate, fat, or alcohol into amino acids in the body. Similar to how we have a way of of converting uh, amino acids into into glucose into glucose via, via gluconeogenesis, yeah. which is a bro's worst nightmare, by the way. <laughs> you never ever want that to happen but i don't believe unless i'm missing something that we can convert something else into amino acids so are we like if we're talking at the extreme of zero protein but enough fiber like i'm saying like they're equal assuming you're getting enough protein and enough fiber they, like they, what's the, let's like, just, what's the let's just argument? let's just say we like both of them we don't need to really be, uh the, well the argument is around um the correlation between strength and lean mass and longevity mm-hmm. and okay. and the increased requirements of protein as someone gets older to maintain mm-hmm. strength and lean mass and bone density, mm-hmm. which are all directly associated with uh, uh, increased lifespan. Mm-hmm. And quality of life. You don't you don't want to fall and break your hip at seventy two and then just be in in real perils for the rest of time. You'd rather be moving and grooving and lifting weights at eighty four and doing kettlebell swings and picking up your great grandkid. Dude, without fiber, you might be getting colon cancer at twenty eight. All those years of just meat, no fiber, you might be having real digestion issues. You might be fucking in stomach pain, keeled yeah, I over. Bloated. I mean, I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to argue the. You might the, not even get to that point. I don't want to argue the carnivore position on this because I, I agree with you. I just don't know that that risk is as high as the risk associated with not having protein, in addition to death. Well, yeah, we've survival. Yes, survival. No, no, yes, but even so thriving where... in the later ages. Let's hit another question. We've beaten this horse. They're both good. This purple wrath is like, see. it's got like a half life of three days. Stuff just lives in you. What is one food you could eat and never get sick of? My mother's apple crisp. Oh, wow. That's a real like homely response. I like that. How about you? Pepperoni pizza. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sushi, pepperoni pizza. Chicken wings. <laughs> as soon as I said sushi, it made me think of when Gary, when I like the first week of coaching Gary. Gary was like, uh, Gary was like, I was like, Gary's like, sushi is a good source of protein, right? I was like, yeah, it's a great source of protein. He's like, oh, I'll have sushi every meal of the day. He's like, oh, and I was like, every meal? He's like, yeah, I'll have it for breakfast. It was my first week coaching Gary. I was like, you'll have sushi for breakfast? And he was like, yeah, I love sushi. I could eat it every day. I'll never get sick of it. I'll eat it for breakfast. I was like, okay. Cause he's, oh, he started to get sick of the Greek yogurts. As apparently you were bringing him Greek yogurts. And then when I started, I didn't know that, but I was bringing him Greek yogurts too. Cause like, this is a great breakfast. I'll bring him Greek yogurts for breakfast. Two, two Greek yogurts after every workout, I went to his office, gave him two Greek yogurts. And he was like, ah, I'm getting sick of these. What else? And he, he was like, sushi's protein, right? I was like, yeah. He's like, okay, I'll have sushi for breakfast. I was like, are you sure? <laughs> then I had to find what fucking sushi place was open at like six in the morning for me to go get sushi for him. So I find a place to get sushi for him at six in the morning. I bring it into his office after our workout and I'll never forget. He was like, what's this? I was like, <laughs> and what time is it? Probably like 9 a.m. Probably like 8 30, 9 a.m. Yeah. He's, he's like, what is this? I'm like, sushi. He's like, for breakfast? I was like, yesterday you told me you would eat sushi for breakfast. He's like, I'm not eating sushi for breakfast. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck, man? Wait, but then, yeah. but then didn't he go, didn't he like call people into his office? He's like, yeah, guys, guys, come here. Look what Jordan got me for <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> or did you, did you so make mad. that part up or did that part happen too? No, 
That part, uh, yes, it absolutely happened. I didn't make that part well, up. I don't know if you're a ridiculous question. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Did maybe you for, make that part for up? a little hyper. I, I found that to be the punchline of the story. So the fact that you left it out on air, I wasn't sure if no, it was full. No, that actually happened. Yeah. And this is actually on, that actually might be on Daily V uh, <laughs> because another part that was on Daily V was, it was easy. It was my maybe second or third day. I'm in there giving him his lunch or making him drink water, whatever it was. And uh, all of a sudden, he calls in Ty and a group of like four to six other people. And he's like, Jordan, what are all their names? And I was like, I don't know. I, I started like two or three days ago. And he was like, all right, well, we'll go around and, and we'll figure it out until you learn it. And I had to go through one by one learning all their names. And then I had, as soon as they said their names, I had to go back around, go back around, go back around until I got it, which as you know, my memory's not good. And not to mention D-Rock's in my face filming me. I, it's like day two or three coaching Gary. I'm still super nervous. <laughs> that was a, a real, real rough entry into the coaching Gary. <laughs> guys, guys, get in here. Look at what Jordan what got me for, for breakfast. breakfast. Ridiculous. I actually, uh, I have some insider information. Or, or I have about what I have. Uh, I have a prediction of of what was happening there. Okay. What was it? I would just imagine that the quality of sushi at somewhere where it's available at seven a.m. <laughs> is like not good sushi. <laughs> and so I'm guessing there was. I mean, an- it's in Manhattan. I know, I know, but I'm guessing there was probably not your fault, obviously, but or he was just really trying to establish dominance. <laughs> See, competitive. <laughs> My mind would not have even gone there. Yeah, well, Gary's super competitive too. He's even more competitive than I am. Let's do one more. We're just rolling. Do you need to be at a certain leanness before starting a bulk? Yeah. How lean? I'm I'm never starting someone a guy on a muscle gain phase above 15% body fat. Yeah, that makes sense. And and we'll keep it real brief, but uh you're going to no matter where you are starting a muscle gain phase, if you're in a calorie surplus, you're going to gain some body fat. Uh and so if you have too much fat at the beginning of the surplus, uh it, it, you're essentially shortchanging yourself on how long you can be in a surplus, which makes it less beneficial obviously. Um, there are probably some calorie partitioning effects where, uh, being leaner leads to more muscle gained relative to fat gain. However, uh, in the last few years, there's been more evidence that that doesn't apply to like super lean levels, right? So if, if you're 30% body fat versus like 13%, the person who's bulking at 13% is probably adding a little bit more muscle relative to fat than the person who's at 30%. But the person who's at like 5% compared to the person who's at 12 or 13%, uh, they might actually be gaining more body fat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, makes total sense. You you went for a question that you thought I'd like. You really... Well, that one just popped up. That was a gift from God being like, this is a mic question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Tuesdays. We're back on Tuesdays. Leave a five-star review, please. And uh, have a good one. We'll talk to you soon. Bye, everyone.